thank you very much. So today I'm going to be talking about how bird songs can be informative in learning about culture and how this can play a critical role in developing a unified theory of cultural evolution. In a few minutes, I'll be introducing you to a little songbird species whose songs appear to be adapted to the acoustic properties of the habitats in which they're found. And then I'm going to show you how computer simulations of these birds and their songs uh, can help us learn about cultures and how they adapt and change over time. Cultural evolution is an approach to studying cultural change by importing ideas that have been developed in the field of evolutionary biology. So essentially, this involves applying neo-Darwinian theories to study cultural change. So just as biologists use paleontological data and taxonomic models to learn how various, or how various um, types of camels have spread across the globe over a millennia and adapted to local conditions of these environments, so linguists can use historical documents and taxonomic models to learn how various languages spread geographically over time. However, not all cultural evolution is focused on these large-scale evolutionary pictures. Uh, some of us, including myself, are interested in the small-scale mechanisms that are driving this change, um, so cultural selection mechanisms. Natural selection is a very powerful tool. It can explain how a close fit can be established between an organism and its environment without the intervention of a rational agent. Roughly, natural selection requires three things. Variation in a population, some kind of systematic selection mechanism that causes some of these variants to be able to produce more than others, and heredity, such that the traits that were selected for can be passed on in a greater proportion to the next generation. So here we have a population of brown and green beetles. The green ones are more easily spotted because their color stands out against the bark and they get gobbled up by birds. Um, and the brown beetles then are contributing more uh, offspring uh, to the next generation, proportionally speaking. Over time, this leads to the accumulation and exaggeration of these traits, with different populations specializing in different ways due to different selection pressures that they face in their local habitats. Now, the theory of cultural selection, which is part of the evolutionary, uh, cultural evolutionary research program, investigates how this powerful tool of natural selection can be imported to study culture. Is it possible that some cultural change takes place by way of a mechanism that's analogous to natural selection? Well, I think it would be very surprising if all cultural change took place like that, but I think it would also be very surprising if none did. To illustrate how this might work, think about how contagious images on the internet can be spread. Um, in fact, they're even referred to as memes, which is a deliberate analogy to the concept of genes uh, developed, uh, a term coined by Richard Dawkins in the 1970s. So a variety of images are available, only some of them are particularly shiny to, uh, to people on the, the internet. They end up posting them to Facebook, to Reddit, and these shinier ideas spread like wildfire, like Grumpy Cat here did. Now, different theorists have proposed a range of different cultural entities as being sort of the quintessential examples of how, cult of how cultural selection uh, works. Um, so nursery rhymes have been suggested, uh, uh, catchy tunes, even the way that men tie their ties, like the super fancy Eldridge knot here. Uh, but the problem has been that if this concept of cultural selection is to be properly scientific, uh, and not just a vague metaphor, we have to be really clear on precisely how this analogy is supposed to work. What is the mechanism? And there have been a lot of debates on precisely this. Some theorists have argued that cultural selection works kind of like viruses work, with contagious ideas that spread like the flu from mind to mind. Others contend that cultural selection works more like DNA, uh, thus the gene meme analogy. Uh, and that ideas are analogous to genes and they get recombined with other ideas in the brain, just like genes and chromosomes get recombined during, uh, during sexual reproduction. Still, other theorists contend that the best way to understand cultural selection is by viewing cultural entities like nursery rhymes as analogous to evolutionary adaptations of organisms, such as the opposable thumb of primates, the necks of giraffes, uh, and the humps of camels. Now, it may be true that one of these analogies to natural selection is better than the others, or it could be the case that cultural selection requires an entirely new uh, understanding of what selection means. But theoretical debates about this have essentially gone around in circles and even sputtered to a halt. 
What is critically needed in order to inform this debate and move it forward are some simple, uncontroversial, empirical case studies of cultural selection, and particularly ones where there's a really clearly defined mechanism at play, and a reliably measurable selection pressure can be identified. So we need to find the equivalent of that bird that is preferentially eating the green uh, beetles over the brown ones. One way to help simplify things is to look at cultures in non-human animals. And there are plenty of well-documented cases of animal cultures where social behaviors are imitated by others. So there's hunting behaviors in whales, potato washing in Japanese macaques, uh, uh, cream stealing by blue tits here. Um, and all of these cases involve innovations made by individuals that are copied by social imitation and spread throughout a population. Now, bird songs in general are a very rich resource for this kind of analysis, and I focus on the, this particular songbird, the South American Rufus Collard Sparrow. Bird songs refer to vocal signals that are sent between males over long distances, as opposed to calls, which are short-range communications. And what makes this particular sparrow species important is that its songs exhibit adapt adaptations to the acoustic characteristics of the environments that they have inhabit, that they uh, live in. And importantly, this makes it really easy to discriminate between the cultural traits on the one hand and the environmental factors that generate the selection pressures. My work is based on the uh, research of uh, biologist Dr. Paul Hanford, uh, professor emeritus from the University of Western Ontario, now Western University. Now, it's important first to know a little bit about how songbirds learn their songs. So after they've been kicked out of their nest by their parents, but before they're mature enough to be able to set up their own territories and attract mates, uh, male, song, uh, male songbirds, when they're very young, referred to as fledglings, uh, spend some time learning a repertoire of songs from a, a collection of adult males that are referred to as their mentors. Importantly, the songs that they learn from their, their mentors are songs that they become imprinted with for life. They are always going to sing those same songs once they've taken on their own territory. And also importantly, uh, the mentors that they choose are not always, and often are not, related to them biologically. Now, once they've matured enough that they're ready to move on and generate and create their own territory, these fledglings will try to find uh, territories next to other birds that share songs in their repertoire. So either they'll try to uh, squeeze in between a couple of mentors, or if that's not possible, a group of birds who have learned overlapping songs from the same group of mentors will take off together and establish a cluster of territories uh, next to each other. And the reason for this is that it's very, very important for male songbirds to sing the same songs as his neighbors. It's critical for defending territories and for attracting mates. These birds engage in what are referred to, referred to as callback displays. So one uh, bird will shout out a song in its repertoire, and the other birds in its neighborhood will shout back songs, ideally the same song or another song that's in that repertoire. Um, and as long as that first bird can recognize that song as being in its repertoire, and it can tell that that bird is far enough away that it's not really trying to encroach on its territory, all is good. Otherwise, you might get into a squabble. So song sharing also helps neighbors defend their mutual territories from interlopers uh, because they might recognize immediately that a bird that's in that territory is singing an unfamiliar song type. Now, other than this important song sharing function between neighboring males, the variations in song elements tend to be functionally equivalent, not so in the Rufus Collard Sparrow, which is why it's so interesting. So the Rufus Collard Sparrow is very ubiquitous in South America. They occupy all of these green areas. And because they're all over the place, people tend to think they're not very sexy or very interesting, but they are very interesting. And their ubiquity contributes to this because they're found in a broad range of diverse habitats, uh, from cities to open grasslands to uh, areas with very dense foliage. What Paul Hansford and his colleagues have done is identify a very strong correlation between the type of songs that birds sing and the type of habitats that they live in. Specifically, the more open the habitat, like a field, the more the bird songs resemble trills. The more closed the habitat, that is, the more it's full of trees and other kind of foliage, the more the song resembles a whistle. And specifically, the trilled or whistled elements are on the end of the song. So um, it's a part of the song referred to as the coda. And here is, I'm going to play you some songs, actually the songs that are depicted in these sonograms. Uh, the first one is typical of the sort of song that you might hear in an open uh, grassland, and it has a trill at the end. The 
The second song is typical of what you might hear in a closed habitat with dense foliage, and it has a whistled coda. Now, Hanford's investigations have ruled out genetics as being the source of this correlation. And he's also been able to rule out morphology, that is, the, the shape or size of the birds. He has posited instead that these are cultural adaptations to the acoustic conditions of these varied environments. Specifically, the hypothesis is that trilled songs don't transmit very well in closed environments because the dense vegetation causes blurs to mask the signal. And by contrast, whistles don't transmit very well in open environments because the lack of redundancy in the signal means that if there's a, a gust of wind, it'll blow away a significant portion of that sound and the signal will be unrecognizable. As a result, the adaptive song type is more readily imitated in the next generation. Thus, Hanford argues, the songs of the rufous-collared sparrow are structured to maximize signal transmission given the acoustic stressors characteristic to the environment. So we appear to have a cultural adaptation here, but the mechanism underlying it is not quite clear yet. Um, we have variation, we have selection, we have imitation, which is the cultural analog of heredity. But how precisely does this get uptake in the sparrow populations? And there are a number of possibilities, and I'll just illustrate three of them. So it's well known that fledglings are more readily uh, able to learn songs that they hear in an undegraded format. So it's possible that fledglings are just hearing the acoustically adaptive song type more clearly and copying it more readily. Another option hinges on the female's ability to hear the songs. It's possible that they are more predisposed to mate with males who are singing the adaptive song type, and that what's triggering the fledglings to copy those uh, mentors would be that they're just sexier to females. And a third option hinges on the adult male's ability to hear the songs. So perhaps birds singing the adaptive song type are just better at that callback display and they get into fewer fights. And the fledglings think to themselves, hey, I think I would rather sing songs that are sung by the dudes who get into fewer fights. So which cultural mechanism, mechanism or mechanisms uh, is most likely to be responsible for the observed correlation, and how do we know this? This is where the simulations come in. More so than simple correlations, computer simulations have the resources to identify specific causal mechanisms at play. And this is exactly what we need if we're going to advance the theory of cultural selection. So the simulation is developed in a program called NetLogo, which is free and offered through Northwestern University. And at its most basic level, uh, the model, which I call singing to neighbors, has two habitat types, forest and field. And birds sing two song types, whistles or trills. And the two types of songs that are sung by a bird are indicated by which, which of these two shapes he has. Um, and there are male and female birds. The male birds uh, have different ages that are obvious that, that you can read off of their color, with the, the fledglings being the darkest. The interface of the simulation allows you to specify a rich set of parameters uh, in the model, which you can either choose freely or you can uh, match to specific data. Here's what an initial, initial random distribution would look like. And a close-up. Now, this is uh, one run of the simulation. Often, these simulations are quite boring to look at. So here's one where all of the birds are freely flying around and flocking together. But if, uh, depending on how you set the initial conditions, you can actually end up with outcomes like this, where populations are that, that are clustered in fields are predominantly um, populated with trilling birds, and populations clustered in forests are predominantly populated with whistling birds. The results of these simulations will be compared to Paul Hanford's field study data in order to calibrate the model and to help determine which cultural selection mechanism or mechanisms are likely responsible for the observed distribution of song types in natural populations. So what we now have are tools with which to identify the cultural selection mechanism responsible for the acoustic adaptation of songs in the rufous-collared sparrow. But how does this feed back into the earlier questions about whether cultural units are more like viruses, genes, traits, or some other entirely new thing? Well, that's what I'm working on figuring out. Um, more reports will be forthcoming.
But importantly, it's these types of computer simulations that have the resources to help address these long-standing theoretical debates and to contribute to the development of a grand unified theory of cultural evolution. So thank you very much for your time.